With that, or no? This is really a team effort, I have to thank uh, the entire team of H2O. Pretty much everybody is involved in this effort. And there's really amazing talent. It's not easy to write these uh, programs. It's not just Python or, or just C++ or just CUDA or integration with Docker. Wait, something a little weird. Yeah. Okay, let's try it again. Is this better? Yeah. OK, great. So yeah, the, the, the strength of H2O, I would say, is the integration of different skill sets, right? Especially in the software world that's so quickly moving. It's the ability to integrate um, software tools together and also know about statistics, know about data science, know about customers, know about Docker, Hadoop, Spark, all these different infrastructures, GPUs. And to put them all together, it's, it's not just one person's work. but the, the essence of this program called h 2 driverless AI is really data science. It's more than machine learning. It's, it's, it's doing what a data scientist would do for them so they can focus on the actual business questions. And there's not too many really good data science in the world, uh, data scientists, even though it's a very hot topic and a very, very good skill set to have. We, we actually don't know that many that are really good at it. And what do I mean by really good at it? I mean not making mistakes. And who knows Andrew Ng? He's the deep learning guru, right? And he, he wrote a paper. This is what they do. X-rays for chest, pneumonia prediction. And they, they, they say, OK, we have a, a deep learning model for this. However, it's wrong. And that was written by a top world's expert, right? The problem was this last sentence. They randomly split the data set into 80-20. Why is that not good? Well, there were only 30,000 patients, but 100,000 images. So roughly, there's three or four images per person of their lung. Now, if you take two pictures of my lung and say, Arno has no pneumonia, let's say. And then there's two more pictures of my lung in my holdout set. Then the model doesn't need to know whether my lung has pneumonia to say no. It just needs to memorize the shape of my bone structure, right? And that's a big mistake. You could say, like, how could you do that mistake? But he's the best, right? So imagine what happens in normal organizations. And this is an obvious mistake. And of course, they fixed it after we pointed it out. But the, the idea is that there's lots of little things like that that are not quite right. Either it's time causality or leakage of the target because the database was you know, updated in place and then you've got the data set that wasn't actually there when you originally created the training data, stuff like that. And for those who, who know data science, those that have practiced it um, for, for years, they know these little subtle details, but most of us don't. So what we did, we automated it, and we got an award for that. And hopefully, our customers will tell us that we did great as well, not just the surveyors. But the, the whole point of this driverless AI is to take the data that comes in as granted, as good. Right? You give us the data. That's what you say is the data. And then we do the best we can with it. So we tune it. We find good models. We, we make new features from that data. But that data is golden to us, because you gave it to us. So your job now is to give us good data. If you give us bad data, then we'll optimize everything we can and give you a bad answer, right? Because it didn't actually solve the problem you wanted to solve. Even though we did the best we could, it's still useless to you. So now you have to focus on the data. And our goal is to give you a quick turnaround cycle from data to insights where all this tuning, this laborious tasks of different model selection, different parameter engineering, feature engineering, um, whether it should be neural nets or gradient boosting or random forest or linear models, should it be depth 8 or depth 20, should it be three layers of neural nets, or should it be a stacked ensemble, should it be target encoding, should it be one-hot encoding, should it be three-way interactions, five-way interactions, should you do binning or not, should you do clustering or not, should you do dimensionality reduction or not. How about we do them all for you and we tell you what works. And that's exactly what did um, 
what we do, did for H2O driverless AI. And if this is a Kaggle problem where 3,000 people competed for two months, including me and other grandmasters here in the audience. And driverless AI places 13th on that final leaderboard out of the box with the push of one button without ever looking at the test set, which is something that no Kaggler would ever do. Right? Every good Kaggler cheats by looking at the test set to look at the distribution of the future and the past and see where is the overlap, what features should I ignore because they change. We didn't even look at the test set. We just look at training, we fit the model, we predict on the test set, we upload it to Kaggle to tell us your 13th place. So that's the power of driverless AI. And how is it done? It's done with grandmaster style feature engineering. The, the things I mentioned earlier. So numeric columns can be transferred to categoricals by binning, right? You can have interactions of those bins with other categoricals. You can have eight-way interactions. You can compute the mean outcome for all these eight-way interactions. If there is not enough evidence in those eight-way groups, then you can maybe take the global mean or some hierarchical mean somewhere along that eight-way interaction. Maybe a seven-way interaction has a better outcome um, because there is some of those. And there's only one eight-way interaction, and you say, ah, I don't have enough evidence. I need to go up a stack. So there's all these logical things you can do that a really good data scientist would do, and we can automate all that, right? Of course, everybody could write a script and say, oh, can't, I can do it. Here's my script. But can you write the script in a way that integrates fully into the whole system and runs on a multi-user system and on GPUs and is always correct and does the holdout validation in the right way and so on? So there's a lot of uh, complexity involved. And we spent the last year and a half just writing this, this driverless AI after we wrote H203 already that had all the algorithms. So this is the grandmaster style feature engineering. And on the right side, you actually see time series. And time series is really a problem about understanding that the past and the future are different, right? So you have to go back in the time. You can't mix up all your rows. So the same 80-20 split earlier, that wasn't good because they mixed the human ID into the, into the train and test. In time, you cannot do the same either. Otherwise, it's cheating, right? You can't look at the stock market of all times and say what's going to happen in 2008. Um, it's going to be cheating. You have to only look up to 2008 to predict, can you predict the crash or not? And what you have to do here is you have to do lags, and you have to have uh, higher order interactions of those lags, partial derivatives, and so on, to see if there's a, a slope that changes. And these kinds of things are, are really uh, the key, the secret sauce of driverless AI. So, for example, in this, this screenshot that you see there, I know the font is a little small, but that's why I wrote it on the right side again. So there's 19,000 features that were tested with 1,000 models. And this run in a few hours, right? And it, it just does it in the background. You don't even have to worry about it. But the GPUs are always busy, always training models. They're fitting lots and lots of models because these models are evaluating the feature quality. Every time you make new features, we let the model tell us if it's useful or not. We don't just build 16,000 features, and then we do one way like elimination of those un until the linear model, let's say, doesn't improve anymore. But we're building GBMs on those, complicated models that are very, very predictive, much more than deep learning. Now, deep learning is really good. You can use it for stacking and blending and so on. And sometimes it's better than uh, gradient boosting for multi-class problems or for problems where you have very complicated interactions that are very hard to do. Um, explicitly or by this grouping logic that I mentioned. But in general, deep learning is, is not necessarily better for this, uh, this, this, this statistical rigor that you need to do these groups. And of course, this, this elimination of weak models is relentless, right? It's survival of the fittest over and over again. So the time series um, recipe is, is basically written by Matthias Müller here. He, he wrote the original um, implementation in Python. He's a grandmaster, and please give him some applause. He's the, the brain behind it. <laughs> and there's another MM, that's uh, Marios Michalidis. He's in Greece, uh, or from Greece, but he's now in the UK, so he couldn't make it, but he also wrote the time series recipe, and both have the initials MM, so this is Otto Eminem, and he will be talking about the details of this. Um, yeah, 
Uh, welcome, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the time here at uh, H. Holbrook in New York City. And yeah, I will just give a brief introduction about our new recipe in wireless AI uh, regarding time series features. And um, well, I do Kaggle a lot, and uh, what I know um, that's really important to get um, um, the validation right, right? So, um, so far, driverless always was about IED data, but as soon as you answer the question to your data, okay, is there any time dependence um, prevalence, and, and you answer this question with yes, then you have to deal with the data in a different way. So you have to create different features, you have to apply a different validation framework, in order to get a good risk estimation about your true error rate and stuff like that. And we're, um, we're really excited to, to announce that we are now capable of doing that in, in the whole driverless AI experience. And the first thing what we can do, and which is I think a really great feature, is that we can automatically detect uh, time groups in the data. So let's say you have weekly uh, sales of stores so that means that you have, um, for each store, a separate time series, so you need to account for that. And driverless AI finds those groups automatically and deals with them in an appropriate way so that your validation score um, is, is not over or underestimating the, the true risk. Um, and as a second point, we have a robust validation framework because validation is uh, you know, essential to, to build valid models. We, we know all models are wrong, but we want uh, useful models. And so what we can do, or what driverless can do for you, is it accounts for gaps between train and test. So what it means is, um, in practice, sometimes your, the point where you start predicting the future is not um, directly after train, but could be a bit delayed. But that means that it's much harder. The problem gets instantly diff more difficult. And if you want to try to assess a validation score for that, you need to account for that. And what also uh, plays a big role is um, how long is your forecast horizon? So do I predict only one week, or two weeks, or three weeks? So that makes a, a big difference in how your validation score would look like. So you need to take that into account. And driverless AI will do that automatically for you. And Besides, we have a comprehensive set of recipes for time series specific feature engineering. So that is something uh, really new. So while well, it starts with really basic features like what is a day of week, a day of month, or something like that, so that's really basic. But then we have some advanced techniques to um, find optimal lags of features as a target, so to use the past information and um, so what it also means it's leakage so we don't cheat, we no, never look into the future. So we always say, okay, we can only, it's only valid to look into the past to predict the future, not the other way around. And we have some uh, sophisticated methods to find optimal lags. Um, we can create interaction of lags and exponential weighted moving averages. Uh, we can also differentiate them and um, create them over different windows, like let's say, uh, weekly to uh, detect weekly patterns or monthly patterns. So, some sort of uh, what kind of patterns do we find in the data? Driverless will find them for you. So, you don't need to care about that. It's all automatically. And we also um, use some um, aggregations of past information, like mean standard sums or when was the time, uh, last time the user bought a certain product, something like that. So, all those kinds of features which are useful in production and also for um, special domains. And yeah, the, um, the killer feature here is that it's fully integrated into the driverless AI's optimization pipeline. It's really easy to set up. So um, um, for the user, uh, not much is changing in the experience how to work with the data. Yeah, so thank you. show you real quick how easy it is to run this. So this is driverless AI. We have this Walmart Kaggle data set. I say predict. What do I want to predict? The target column is my weekly sales. Now this is a problem where there are stores. Walmart has 45 stores that they're looking at in this data set. And each store has a bunch of departments. And for each department, you want to predict the sales for the next 39 weeks. 
That's the challenge. So all we need to do now, we provide um, the test set because that's giving us information about how long we need to predict for, right? That's the horizon, the forecast horizon. We also know the gap between training and testing based on these two data sets. So we can select the time column to be automatic and it will figure out everything from here automatically. So this is it. I just press these two buttons. I can maybe pick the right uh, loss function to make it the same as what Kaggle wants. And here it is. And after a minute or so, you'll see a bunch of lag features show up, automatically ranked in importance, and it will basically just keep improving until it, it, it flatlines. And then it will stop and say, okay, I couldn't do any more, that's it. And then you have a deployable pipeline at the end that puts the entire feature engineering, all these lags and things in time, it's all automatically packaged up for your deployment time. So you give us a row with a future date stamp, and it will tell you what the sales is based on the store and the department and other features. So here you can see now already there's a, the top feature is, for example, the lag, um, the, the, the sales of the target 44 weeks ago or 52 weeks ago. So there's some seasonality with one year periods. That's like Christmas, right? Every Christmas is more intense. But there's also a 44 week periodicity, which means it could be Thanksgiving or something like that. It's not exactly one year. All right, to come back to this, it's basically all built in. It does these smart pieces of holdout validation splits, as what Matthias mentioned earlier. And we also do deep learning in case you're wondering, like, is it all actually boost? No, it's not. It's TensorFlow, it's linear models, it's gradient boosting, it's random forest, different types of models. So when you turn the knobs, it'll tell you what kinds of models it's looking at. And the, the next version that we're shipping this week will have TensorFlow in it, both as a main model during the evolution of the feature engineering for, let's say, multi-class. If you have a problem with 20 different outcomes classification, that's much more efficient than gradient boosting. Because in gradient boosting, you would have to build 20 times more trees. But for neural nets, it's just 20 more neurons that have to be connected. So it's very cheap. And um, so basically, we'll have TensorFlow in the product and linear models, and we will stack them all if you want that based on the accuracy. And of course, you can configure it to be not enabled. You can have only XGBoost models if you prefer, or only linear models, or only uh, TensorFlow, XGBoost, whichever you want, basically. They all have exclusive modes or shared modes. And I recommend these two books for everybody who is not familiar with this field, uh, either statistical machine learning or deep learning. Both have their merit, and we, we hybridize the two, right? We make features based on statistics, and then we throw it into our neural nets and say, squeeze out even more juice. And of course, we can explain it all, and we can also visualize it all, and there will be talks about these respective fields, too. So I was just talking about the time series pieces most and about the inner feature engineering, but automatic visualization is something that Leland will talk about, and machine learning interpretability is something that Patrick Hall will talk about as well. This is the overall roadmap. You see it's already pretty populated, but there will be new things coming up, such as NLP with deep learning and model management. So you can see which model is doing well, and then you can deploy the one that you want. Thank you for your attention. We really want feedback more than anything. So even if you choose not to become a customer, tell us why, okay? Thanks. <laughs>